I would like to introduce you to Dr. Tom Arricci. He is a neurodevelopmental pediatrician at the Evelina Hospital and a senior clinical lecturer. Um, so um, very much, very knowledgeable in the condition and uh, plenty of experience. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Asper, and, and thank you so much for inviting me today because it's a really exciting event. Um, it's a real pleasure to chat to people today, to meet different people. And um, I think it's a real opportunity for everyone, isn't it, to learn about the condition, but also to engage with each other. So thank you uh, for organizing this and, and inviting me. I've tried, I hope I've got it right, to, to pitch this at a level which will be interesting to all of you, accessible to all of you, and hopefully not cover or contradict things that have been said in the other presentations today. Um, but if I do, then everyone start waving your hands and tell me I'm, I'm uh, going in the wrong direction. I can certainly rewind. The other thing is that Asper's given me a very, very long time to talk. So um, I can talk a lot, but hopefully I'll try and leave quite a lot of time at the end for questions so we can, uh, we can talk about things as well. So as Asper said, um, I uh, work at King's College London. So I do research at King's College London, but I'm also a consultant in paediatric neurodisability and particularly um, work looking after um, monitoring, assessing, and managing children with neurodevelopmental disorders at the Evelina London Children's Hospital. Um, so just to, to kind of, work by way of context, I think many of you either have come from Met a Parents Day who, who's come through the Evelina, but generally speaking, the way it works around London is, I suppose, south of the river, so South Thames and all the way down to Brighton, the Evelina Children's Hospital will be the tertiary referral centre, and of course, north of the river, it's Great Ormond Street up to, to kind of Cambridge and, and all the way through to to Norfolk and things like that. So um, what that means is that the Evelina is that we will see many people referred to us during the pregnancy. And that's perhaps when the diagnosis of, of dysgenesis of the corpus callosum is, is made. And then um, I would be one of the people that would see families after the diagnosis is made and, and speak to the families about it and perhaps continue to see the child as they get older. And so that's kind of what I'm gonna talk about today is that kind of process and hopefully give you a bit of insight into that process and, and I suppose the way of thinking of a pediatrician. Um, so what we kind of are trying to think about to, to try and get across to the families and what we try and do in terms of the management. I'd actually be very interested to get some feedback from you guys because I may be missing the point completely and I may not be actually telling parents the right things and, and it may be that we're not explaining things in the best way. So it'd be great to, to get some feedback from you guys as well about that. Um, the other thing that I'm going to talk about, just because it's my academic passion, but also it's a big part of my clinical passion, uh, or my clinical work, is, is MRI scanning. I don't know if you can see my mouse. So this is obviously a fetal MRI scan that you can see on the left here. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the process of, of what kind of information we get from the scan and things like that as well. Um, I don't know how much we've had. We've had a little bit about MRI scanning, I think I understand today, but I was hoping that if I put some of those things in, it would help you guys as well, just to, to when people are talking about these things, when you go to appointments or when you can think back to when it was during the pregnancy or around the time that your baby was born and people were talking about things that they saw on the MRI scan, I thought perhaps if I put some of these things up, it might help you a little bit to put those things in, into context for you. So this is what I was going to talk about. So diagnosis and investigation in dysgenesis of the corpus callosum. So understanding sort of the what, the why, and the whens. And most important for me, it's about sort of impairing, empowering parents and families with information. Um, just for, for kind of clarification, I know that you've had some talks today about sort of dysgenesis of the corpus callosum, agenesis of the corpus callosum, um, hyperplasia of the corpus callosum. I'm just going to call it DCC throughout this because I think it's a little bit easier and I think part of the reason I'm going to do that is of course there is still some uncertainty about really what the outcomes are across this and I think it's easier if we just talk about DCC. I have to confess there are probably some slides that have snuck in there where it still says ACC and things like that and if it is I apologize and I probably should have changed it to DCC but we're, we're going to talk about DCC today. And then just to go on to then talk about assessing and optimizing neurodevelopment through childhood and about thinking about how we can try and put the right support in place if it's needed and of course plan for the future. So a little bit of developmental biology. I won't labor on this forever, but the first thing to say really why I've put this on here is just for you guys to get an idea about really what's happening inside the brain right from the very, very earliest stages on the left here that we've got a very, very simple structure 
And what happens, I mean, this is amazing to imagine that this is happening inside someone's tummy when a brain is being formed and, the, and a baby is being formed, that we're going from a structure which is basically like a tube and then it's progressing over just a couple of weeks and that we're starting to see, you can see here, a corpus callosum starting to form by eight weeks. So you can see something starting to tuck in and it's something that's starting to connect from one side of the brain to the other. And so the corpus callosum starts forming super, super early in your pregnancy in the first trimester and it's generally formed by about 20 weeks gestation. And I think the reason I put this here is not to bore you with some biology, but actually because it's really important to kind of get that across to you that when we're thinking about when people see things on scans and when people talk about things in council families, it's actually very important to say that this is something that's there from a very early stage. And of course, it's, it's going to change the way the brain develops around it, but it's something that we hopefully can see and then we can try and understand a bit better. And then what on the right here is, oh God, it's come out awful, hasn't it? Because I've reproduced it and blown it up. But what I'm just showing here is that when we think about the different kinds of things that we can see in terms of all of the different kinds of abnormalities in the corpus callosum that are possible, and then they might start to be evident at different kinds of ages across here. So in most cases, and it'll be interesting to, to chat to people in the room, I would say nowadays that dysgenesis of the corpus callosum is first seen on the antenatal ultrasound probably by 20 weeks. And it's usually by seeing differences in the size and the shape of things like the fluid spaces in the brain, or perhaps the presence of particular structures. Now, these are some ultrasounds here, and I'll be the first to admit that even to me, they look like a grade A in Bogner. Okay, they're not the easiest thing to try and understand what's going on there. I've made the mistake of saying that before, and then someone said, I'm from Bogner. It's a lovely place, <laughs> <laughs> but you've got grade A's in Bogner. So the point is, is that when we look at these things here, what we're looking at basically is, is, if I'm just moving my mouse around here, so this is obviously the shape of the head that you can see here. And what you can see on an ultrasound, the most important thing is the difference between tissue and fluid, okay? And these kind of darker areas that you can see here, I think it's much clearer on this, this middle one is when we're looking now from the front, is these darker spaces here are the fluid spaces inside the brain. And that's what we call the ventricles. When people have been talking about the ventricles, those are the fluid spaces that sit inside the center of your brain. And the reason that we have the fluid spaces inside our brain is, and this is, sorry, an orphan analogy, but this often one which I think families find easy to understand, is that it acts like a suspension system inside the brain. Okay, so if you put some jelly inside a bowl and you shake the bowl, the jelly unfortunately is gonna to break to pieces when you do that. If you put the jelly inside some water and you shake the bowl, it's not gonna to smash to pieces. Okay, so the brain has got fluid around it and it acts to protect the brain, but it also acts as a really nice bath which can contain all the important kinds of nutrients and chemicals that the brain needs as well. And so the fluid around the brain is super important and we can see the fluid spaces which run around. So again, we're looking from the front of the brain and this is some fluid that you can see around and in the center of the brain on the ultrasound, okay? And often what people can see on the ultrasound, when people talk about dysgenesis or agenesis or, or an abnormality in the corpus callosum, is a difference in the shape of these fluid spaces. So if we go in the center here, so this is where there is complete agenesis of the corpus callosum, you can see that the ventricles, these fluid spaces, they look different to these ones here, okay? And what's happened is, is that because there isn't that structure in between, the fluid spaces have gone and formed in a different shape and tucked into a different position. And that's what people often see on those first ultrasounds. The other thing that you can see here, and this is when we're now looking from the side, so this is the nose of the baby here, and this is the back of the head here, is this structure here, which I always say looks like a piece of bacon that you can see in the center there. And that's um, what we call the cavum septum pellucidum, which sits right in the center of the brain. And you can imagine, because you are, I'm sure, all experts on the corpus callosum now, you can imagine that if we know that the center of the brain is formed differently, that the, the um, cavum septum pellucidum in the center is also gonna be absent or look different. And so if you look here in a child with agenesis of the corpus callosum or a fetus, you can see that there's, that piece of bacon isn't evident. And so that's something that uh, ultrasonographer, when they're doing the antenatal ultrasound, can pick up relatively easily nowadays. So, and then on the far right, we have a partial agenesis where you can see that even here, it's a little bit more subtle. So we're somewhere in between, aren't we? So you can see here, we've got no piece of bacon. Here we can see there's sort of something there, but it doesn't have quite the same appearance. And here you can see the ventricles, they do look different but they're not quite as pulled up into what we call, these are called bullhorn ventricles, we typically call them, that you can see in the center here. So they're not quite in that same shape. 
Now, I did promise you I'm not going to bore you with too many images, but that was just to kind of give you an idea about the kind of things that we would first see on the scan, and that kind of puts us in a certain way of thinking. So what happens next? <clears throat> Typically, a family may have a discussion with a member of the obstetric team at that stage about those initial appearances seen on the ultrasound scan, and they may suggest a repeat ultrasound scan, and then typically they get referred for an MRI scan, and that's when they may have a discussion with someone from the fetal medicine team or someone from neurology or neurodisability like myself, which would be at the Evelina. So why do we do fetal MRI scans? So the reason that we do MRI scans at all, and this is really something that's come in in the last 10, 15 years, is that, of course, there's no radiation with doing an MRI scan, and it can provide far, far more detailed images of the brain than, a, than an ultrasound. Okay, so we're not looking at Bogner anymore that you can see down on the bottom left there. We can really see the structures in the brain very clearly. And <clears throat> the other thing that we can see is that we can see the whole body really nicely and we can get some really nice detailed images like this one here of a baby thrashing around inside the womb, which can give us some extra information about the baby. I love this pose here. It looks like they're having a little think with their, like Rodan's thinking here. But you can see the heart pumping away in the, in the middle there. And there's, there's lots of information that we can get about the behavior of the baby as well, which is beautiful. The additional information that we can get from the MRI is really important from an academic point of view, from, a, from understanding scientifically what's going on inside the brain. The reason I mention this is this is kind of, for me, I think one of the next stages where I'd really like to think that we would be able to move clinically is to understand if we can see things on an MRI scan, we can measure them on an MRI scan and we can actually understand really detailed things about the biology inside the brain. So on the left, this is what we call diffusion MRI, which is where we can look at how water moves around the brain, and we can actually use that to understand the white matter tracks, so those pathways inside the brain that connect one part of the brain to another. And you can see the corpus callosum in the center here. So this is the corpus callosum in this young, so the top row is actually the youngest ones that are 22 week gestation fetuses. And this is up through to 36 weeks that you can see here. And the corpus callosum, we've just delineated the fibers running from one side of the brain to the other. But you can see some of the other key white matter pathways that are running through the brain, like the wires inside the brain to connect other regions of the brain as well. And the other thing that we can do with MRI scans is that we can actually look at activity inside the brain as well. And so we can look at coordinated patterns of activity inside the brain. And that means we can also understand how do they change across gestation in, in fetuses and, of course, in children with dysgenesis of the corpus callosum as well. So how about fetal MRI in, in DCC? So why do we do an MRI at all? So the reason that we do the MRI is really to answer the key question about whether or not we can see any additional brain anomalies on the scan. It can help us to monitor the size and shape of the fluid spaces in the brain, but to be perfectly honest, and I think this may have been covered in one of the other lectures as well, we invariably do see slightly enlarged ventricles, and that's probably something that you had, all of you had chats about during the pregnancy, and people talked about hydrocephalus and the ventricles progressively getting larger and things like that. I have to confess, in my experience, I've never seen them really get bigger, but it's something that we do keep an eye on and we do monitor. Um, but uh, it's one of the things that is very obvious on the scans, but that's a secondary thing that often people would refer the child for a, or the fetus for a scan with us for. But really the main reason is for us to know whether or not it's isolated dysgenesis of the corpus callosum and whether or not we can see any additional things on the scan, okay? So when we look on these scans here that you can see, it's very different obviously to what we could see on the ultrasound. And we can see here that there isn't a connection between the two sides of the brain. We can see enlarged ventricles. And if you think about the, what I showed you in the ultrasound before, we can't see the piece of bacon that you can see in the center here. So you can't see the, the, the cavum septum pellucidum. And here you can see again that this is now looking from the front that you can see the division between the two sides. Now, apart from seeing that you, there's no couples close in there, the, the key point is, is that you can really see on this scan things like the lining of the brain, which is called the cortex. So the cortex is the surface of your brain. It contains all the little cells that do the computational work in your brain. And the reason that our brains are folded is because that means if we fold our brains and we can pack in more and more of those cells so that we can do more and more complex work with our brains. And so on here, what we can see is the lining of the brain and the cortex, and that gives us an idea about how the brain is forming. And if you have isolated um, dysgenesis of the corpus callosum, what we tend to see is that the cortex is continuing to develop relatively nicely, and that's an important thing for us. And so what we want to see on the MRI scan is see what's happening with the cortex on the surface there. 
Why is this important? It's important because we know when there's isolated DCC, it's associated with higher survival and lower rates of developmental and intellectual difficulty. So just in terms of the conversations that we have with families, it makes a big difference for us. Uh, sorry, this is a very busy slide, but really the other thing really I've, I've just put on here is to emphasize that MRI is done because it's been shown now in quite a few studies that it does find additional anomalies on the scan compared to ultrasound alone. And um, it's an important consideration, therefore, that if we can find it in, in like 10, 15 percent, that we can start to see more things. Then that's why we do the scan, because it gives us the ability to be able to have those important conversations. And so some of those additional appearances, which again might be something that you may have had these discussions during the, the pregnancy, is sometimes we might see a cyst in between the two sides of the brain, or we might see something like a lipoma, which is a, a, a bit of fat in between the sides of the brain. Or you may see something very subtle, which is what I've just put this one up here, is just to show you that where the arrows are pointing towards, I'm, if you were just to, I'm making you all radiologists in the room now, if you were just to compare one side of the brain with the other side, Hopefully I can convince you that you can see there's a little notch here which looks slightly different to the opposite side, okay? And you can imagine if you were looking at an ultrasound, it would be very, very hard to pick up something small like that. But on the MRI scan, we can see this little notch and we can see the image in 3D and we can see that it, it relates to an area that just looks a little bit different in the surface and the cortex there. And that gives us an idea that the cortex is forming a little bit differently and that has implications for how the brain will then go on to work. How about genetic tests? So again, I'm sure that's something you had discussions about. Genetic tests are important, and we always do ask for a genetic test. And it's usually done, of course, by an amniocentesis, which I can't imagine how terrifying it must be to have an amniocentesis or to have the conversation that someone says they want to do an amniocentesis. It will tell us a difference if they're in, in the number of the chromosomes. So I always say when I speak to families, the chromosomes, if your genetics are like a library, the chromosomes are like the books inside that library. And so what we're doing first is counting whether or not they're the right number of books in the library. And a classic example of when there is a different number of books is Down syndrome, for example. So you have, extra, you have an extra chromosome in Down syndrome. And that has a very profound effect, of course, in terms of how the entire library is then working because there's an extra book. Or it can be something specific to a gene. And the genes are like the recipes inside that book. Okay, and it can be as small as a tiny misprint in one of the recipes, and even that tiny misprint, so one letter difference, can make a massive difference in terms of what the food you're going to make from that recipe tastes like, and that's what uh, looking at the smaller genes is like. And so that's why it's important for us to do the genetics, because this can give us much clearer information about the future and tell us if there's any other parts of the body that might be involved and we need to think about. So this, this is a chromosome that you can see on the left here, and then this is what the, the, we're talking about with genes. Why is this relevant? So the genetics of, of sort of isolated DCC is a really rapidly expanding field. But the thing to say is that if I, OMIM is one of the online kind of repositories that we look for genes. There are 385 conditions that are described now which have got dysgenesis of the corpus callosum mentioned in it. And so it's something that we really, really need to know more about. And that's why genetics is important. A genetic cause in, in 2020 was found in 23% of cases of isolated DCC. And I suspect the number is obviously bigger and bigger. It's going to keep getting bigger. And as our knowledge base grows, then obviously this is going to provide more and more specific information for families so that they can really understand what it means for, for prognosis and about understanding about how the corpus callosum is different in those situations. So what does this all mean for the future? This is, of course, the challenging discussion that you guys have had with someone like me. And traditionally, the conversation that people often had, I would say, 20 or 30 years ago, is that DCC is associated with really big problems with your motor and cognitive function, epilepsy, problems with, with social and language difficulties, and autism, schizophrenia, and so on. However, the important thing to say is that this historical data was really based on, on symptomatic cases which were presenting and being reported, and uh, importantly, a lack of distinction between isolated DCC and more kind of complex cases and things like that, which is an important thing as well. And so what we really need to think about is, is when we have these conversations, is what is that extra information that we're gleaning from the scans and things like that. Because the important thing to say is what we can generally say is that studies of truly isolated DCC suggest that outcome is, is relatively favorable. So neurodevelopmental outcomes are within the normal range in about 70 to 80% of kids. 
Um, although it's important to say, so sorry, this very busy slide with the lots of numbers is basically showing that in the control group here, so kids without DCC, you can see their performance across all these different areas. So social, um, motor, so moving skills, language, um, looking at letters and numbers and things like that is around 100. And you can see that when we talk about the normal range, we're basically looking at scores when they perform these kind of assessments and, and kids with DCC are within what's called the normal range because it will be down to 85 is considered to be a normal range up to 115. And you can see that they are slightly performing less than their peers, but they are within that range down to 85. And that's important because I think, yes, we can say that um, the kids are going to do well in terms of their neurodevelopment, but it's also important that we need to be realistic and say to parents that they will be developing slightly differently than their peers. And this is always a challenge if you pick up a scientific article as parents and it says things like a neurodevelopmental assessment or neurodevelopmental outcome was normal, that doesn't necessarily mean too much to you as a parent. And as clinicians, it's very common as clinicians, we don't, you know, different doctors will read those articles and not know what they're talking about in terms of neurodevelopmental outcomes. Um, for me, because it's something I do, then I know that when I read the article, I need to be careful to understand what they're describing as the neurodevelopmental outcome. Frequently, what it's based on is some kind of an assessment that they've had with someone like a psychologist or a doctor, and they've sat down and some done like a, almost a baby IQ test kind of thing, and that's what they're, they're scored at. But they're often based at something like 18 months to two years of age. And so they're only reflective of what's going to happen to the kids at 18 months to two years of age. And so it is important to take these things with a pinch of salt. The other thing that we often talk about or we see is increased rates compared to the general population of, of certain other things like epilepsy or language difficulties or coordination difficulties. The thing I want to get across here is that, of course, you can see again that the numbers are not really that high. Okay? They are significant. They're worth talking about but actually they're much, much lower than the kind of numbers that we were talking about or, or people were thinking about probably 30 or 40 years ago. So this is important. It's important to mention them. And I have the conversations with the parents that these are things that we need to think about. But actually we can see that the rates are, are relatively, relatively low. So what's the overall goal of me counselling? So what I like to do or what I try to do is describe what the corpus callosum is in the first place. I'm I, personally, I find it quite useful to draw pictures and to go through things like that and explain to them that it hasn't developed and explain that, unfortunately, if it hasn't formed by 20 weeks, then it's not going to form later. I think that's an important thing for, to understand because I think many parents, they've got it in the back of the head that perhaps it can change. It's important for us to understand if it is isolated and understand if there is a clear genetic cause or a chromosomal disorder. So that's why we do the investigations that we do in terms of the amniocentesis and the MRI scan. And then it's important for us to think about what we think we know about for future outcomes and charted, but we need to acknowledge, which is the hardest thing for parents, that there is uncertainty because the brain is still developing and we know that every child is different. One of the things that's important to say is every child is different and every family is different as well. And the environment that a child grows up is indifferent as well. So all of those things are going to key together. And so what I say to the families is that the most important thing for that uncertainty is that we and you engage, we engage together and we're in this together to see how your child develops and we are assessing your child as they grow up. And that means we can understand what their difficulties are, but of course what their strengths are as well. And how can we support your child in the best way? So this is, uh, this is an analogy that I use for practically everything, I'm afraid. So I often talk about to parents about their, the tube map inside your head, okay? So this is the underground map, the London underground map, from um, about 100 years ago or so, okay? Very unhelpfully, you can see on the top left that actually the colours on the tube map were different about 100 years ago. So the central line is actually the blue one running through the middle here, okay? This is the central line. And uh, this is actually the Piccadilly line, the yellow one here. Now, the reason I, I put this up is because actually the way that we've discovered over time that the brain works is that different parts of the brain are like stations inside your brain and that we have white matter pathways. So we have kind of wires running through the brain which connect one region of the brain with the other. Okay? And when you're a baby or when you're a fetus, your brain looks something like this. Okay? It doesn't have as many stations and it doesn't have as many railway lines in it yet. Okay? but some of the lines are already there. So the central line and the key part of the central line is already there. 
the northern line and the northern line extension up to kind of Highgate and so on is already there. So some of the lines are already there and the rest of the line is going to continue to developing or the rest of the network is going to continue developing over time. And so if you have unfortunately an agenesis of the corpus callosum or dysgenesis of the corpus callosum, we have lost those parts there. So we've lost the central line and we've lost parts of the Piccadilly line connecting one side of the brain to the other. Okay, so what does that mean? As you get older and as the tube network continues to develop and you end up with something like this, which is our London Underground map now, then what we know is that the central line and the Piccadilly line there are gonna be interrupted, okay? Now, why is that relevant? It's relevant because, yes, you can still get through to the other side of, of London. And that's important to say that. You can still get round to the other side of London, but it's going to be slightly different, your route, okay? You can't get through to London. You can't get from Notting Hill Gate through to Stratford as quickly, okay? So you might have to get there in a slightly different route. What we don't understand as clinicians and scientists, and what we want to understand is, of course, how does the tube network then change in terms of how the trains are then running? to try and compensate for that. And that's something that we would dearly really like to understand and how we can try and help with the trains run in a slightly different way. But the point is, is that the tube map continues to develop, but it just has to develop in a slightly different way and the trains can still get there from one side to the other. But unfortunately, the central line and the Piccadilly line aren't going to change, okay? If they didn't, if they weren't built in the first place, as the tube map evolves, unfortunately, they're still gonna not be there. So the next, question that people or the discussions this is kind of what I find when I talk to the families the big questions that they want to know is what will their quality of life be like and what will having a child with DCC affect how will it affect their family or other children that they've got in the family and how they can enjoy family life and that's why obviously working with corporal and working with charities is incredibly important and I'm sure all of you are here because you had that experience and you had that experience of really benefiting from speaking to other families and and um, understanding what it's like for other people. And that's something which I think is really, really important. I think in terms of quality of life, I think the thing that I say to everyone is it's really important for me to acknowledge that every child and their family is very, very different. Okay, I don't have the answers, but actually I think what we can do is empower you with information. We can try and give you as much information as possible. And we can talk about what we can try and do to understand the challenges that your child might have to try and improve your quality of life as much as possible. And one of the things I, I really want to, I always emphasize with families is that even if life is different, it doesn't mean that it's not good, okay? Kids with dysgenesis of the corpus callosum, they may think slightly differently or they might behave slightly differently, but they can love, they can be loved, they can show how much they love their family, they can enjoy things, and they will enjoy things and they'll have their preferences and yes they will develop differently but that doesn't make them any less wonderful or amazing and that's across the board really when I speak to families who have got developmental difficulties I think it's really important for families to understand that because I think depending upon the person some people can become very worried about whether or not that's that's going to be something that's possible for them as a family so after birth so we're moving on to the next stage and and so after birth then we think about doing a postnatal MRI scan. The reason I think it's worth doing a postnatal MRI scan is if this is a fetal scan, then this is the neonatal scan, okay? So you can see that we've moved now, so we had Gray Day and Bogner, and then we moved into kind of, you know, two megapixels, and then you can see when we move here, then we're, we're using high definition when we go and do a neonatal scan. And so if we do a neonatal scan, then that means that we can understand not only how the brain has continued to develop, but then we can get really, really good detail about what's going on. So in this particular case here, this kind of dark area that you can see here is, is a little ball of fat that was in the center of the brain. And so we could see it on the fetal scan there. But what we wanted to see on the neonatal scan is exactly where it was, how far it's extending, whether or not we need to talk about it with a neurosurgeon, which we did, but we didn't need to do anything. And then you can see its effect on the structures around it as well and things like that. And so in this particular situation, the postnatal scan was a very, very reassuring thing to do because then it meant we could then be in a position where we could say, okay, we don't need to worry about doing brain surgery or anything like that, which is something that we slightly worried about on the first scan because you just wanted to make sure what's gonna happen with this area. Similarly, this is another case here. So you can see, actually, I'll, I'll put this off here, but you can see that there's agenesis of the corpus callosum. There's a cyst in the center of the brain that you can see here. And you can see the, 
the parallel fluid spaces in the center that you can see there, which is quite a characteristic thing that we might see because they form slightly differently because of the, you know, being, because of the lack of a corpus callosum. And then when we do the MRI scan, what we could see is that there was a difference just here where I put the red arrows, um, just in terms of the, the areas right at the base of the brain and here in what's called the pituitary gland, which is a really important gland for secreting hormones that control for how often you might go to the toilet, how, whether or not you're a girl or a boy, your growth hormone, how you use sugar in your body. So it's a very, very important part of your brain. And so the MRI scan was very, very important in this case because it meant that then this child went to see an endocrinologist, so a hormone specialist, who then put the child on, on hormone supplements to make sure that there were, there were um, no problems in terms of their growth and, and various other things through life. And so the postnatal scan here was really a very, very useful thing to have done. Um, so, just thinking now more widely, so the role of a neurologist and a neurodevelopmental pediatrician more widely. So, the incidence, of, you know, globally is, is around one in 4,000 individuals. I think that's the, that's the latest figure I could find. I don't know if anyone's got, but that's relatively common. So, at the Evelina London, we see about five to ten families each year, actually, with this genesis of the corpus callosum, mostly in pregnancy. So, they'll come to us. We'll do the MRI scan, we'll do the ultrasound, the MRI scan, we'll talk to the family. They don't necessarily come back after the delivery because then they may be followed up in Brighton, they might be seen in Margate, they could be all over the place. But we would see them during the pregnancy. And we'd meet the family early, we'd discuss the appearances and, and the implications, usually after the first MRI scan. I feel naked without an MRI scan, so I, I like to have the MRI scan and that helps me to sit down and, and talk with the family. And then after birth, then what I tend to do is I'll see the babies, I'll examine the baby, and I'll discuss the MRI scan appearances after, after we've done one. And for me, I think it's always important to discuss the diagnosis and the prognosis again, because there are lots of new questions and you know the family have sat there and thought about it. They've gone on the internet, they've gone on different forums, they've spoken to ASPA, and so they've got lots of things that they want to talk about. And so it's important to have that discussion again and then to initiate referrals and things if, if needed for, for hormone assessment or for eye assessments and things like that. Many of the times those assessments will happen. They don't need to be done again, but it's a reassuring thing to have it done the first time. Uh, oh, there we go. So what we do at the Evelina, and I am in no way saying or prescribing that this is what everyone should be doing in the country, but this is just to give you an idea about the service that I've put in place for the kids that I see. What we do is we monitor the ongoing development of the child through the first couple of years. And I do that because I think it's really important um, for the reasons that I put on the bottom here that we'll go, across, go into, which is to think about, don't forget the brain's still developing. Okay, so we know that there is, is an abnormality in the corpus callosum, and what we want to know is that the brain is going to continue developing and the child is going to continue developing with that. So are they meeting their kind of developmental milestones, the things that we'd like them to be doing as they grow older? Is there anything unexpected or unusual that they're doing? So might they be having seizures or some abnormal movements, or are there other things with their vision and things that people are concerned about? And of course, does that mean there are any associated difficulties that we need to start treating? So I tend to see the kids at three months, six months, 12 months, and 24 months. And at each stage, I do my clinic with a physiotherapist. And so we, we see the kids together. And then we do what are called standardized assessments at the time, which are basically, you've probably seen the doctors and physios sitting there with these kind of bunches of paper. We still use paper, of course. And then we're sitting there circling things around the little stick man to see the position of the baby and the muscle strength and things like that. And that's what we do when they're young. And as they get older, then we start to look at some, some more um, wide skills. Um, and so what can we tell parents to do? So these are actually kind of more generic slides that I put in here because I'm a developmental pediatrician. I look after kids with cerebral palsy particularly. And so even though I look after kids with cerebral palsy, I think it's, uh, you know, which is, is different. I think it's relevant, these slides. So what can we tell parents to do? Why do we bother to do those assessments? Why am I talking about looking for those things? So this was some work done in Australia, um, the lead authors, Iona Novak, and, and it was a very good review that they did to look at all of the different kinds of interventions that can be done in early infancy for someone with probable cerebral palsy or, or difficulties with, with a brain injury. And so it's not specific, as I said, to, to corpus callosum, but I think it's relevant. So what they basically said is if you can identify things early, then we should think about how we can optimize motor, cognitive, and communication outcomes using interventions that promote learning and neuroplasticity, which is plasticity is how the brain can change itself. 
And then that will help us to prevent secondary impairments and minimize the influence of complications. Um, and then, of course, try and reduce things that could worsen function or interfere with learning later on. And then the third one, I think I was really pleased to see this in, in the article, was of course to promote parent and caregiver coping and to think about how we can really help reduce the stress, the anxiety and the depression that's associated with the condition. So if we can identify something early, then it helps, even if it's not good news, it also helps reduce that uncertainty and it means the parents know what they're dealing with and then we can try and involve them in the process of trying to manage it. And so it's really important, you know, the summary of this is really important to encourage early regular engagement with physiotherapists, occupational therapists, speech and language therapists, the local child development team and so on. And so it's about really getting engaged with those services. Then there was a, a later review, again, specific cerebral palsy, but I still think relevant, which was um, done by Cathy Morgan. And they were talking about thinking about CP-specific interventions, which, um, again, the take-home messages are still very relevant and similar, which is really that when we're thinking about interventions, we should be thinking about doing setting goals and doing task-specific, context-specific kind of interventions that appropriate level of challenge and they're updated all the time. So it's about defining goals with the family for what's important for the child to keep developing. I can sit here and say, I think I want your child to, uh, you know, to, to write words worth. It, for me, that's, that's my choice. It's not important for your child. It's not important for your family. And that's why it's important that the family is, uh, and the child, of course, is, is helping to determine those goals. And that's what we should be trying to base our therapy around. And the clinicians can provide coaching education to increase knowledge and impart support for parents and caregivers. Okay, so really to promote that kind of positive parent-child relationship. And so parent participation, the kind of conclusion from this Cathy Morgan paper was that parent participation in this whole kind of intervention process is really important. And they also said, this is kind of a thing where it's changed quite a lot is it's really important to think about frequent practice of activities that really promote independence so skilled things and independence which is what really people should be focusing on these early interventions so um, just going back then to what we do so then if we see concerns we might then ask our colleagues, particularly the occupational therapists, to think about some of those different kinds of interventions. Otherwise, what would happen in our clinic after we've seen a child at three, six, and 12 months, at 24, then they would come for a standardized neurodevelopmental assessment, which you may have heard people talking about, oh yeah, two, we'll get them to come and do a Bailey's and things like that. What a Bailey's is, is basically a clinical assessment where we would get a child, it's like a kind of a baby IQ test. So what we would do is get them to perform a series of fixed tasks and this can allow us to assess specific developmental areas. There are different flavors. So there's a Griffith assessment, and there's a schedule of growing skills, there are various different things. And to a certain extent, which one is chosen in a different place can be very variable. I think in the UK, largely speaking, it's the Griffith or the Bailey scale of assessment. And you may have done this with your child where you've had to sit there for about an hour and a half. They've got very grumpy halfway through. Everyone's getting very stressed and annoyed about the whole thing. And the parents always feel, oh, they can do that. They can do that. And the child won't do it on the day. But regardless, the point is it's, it's a really, really important thing for us because it's standardized. So it means at the end of it, we'll get a score which we can compare to the rest of the population. And what it means is we can identify areas which need development. Okay, And, and as I said, areas of strength as well. And so at the end of it, we'll have a score for their gross motor skills, which is how they kind of get around and do things, their fine motor skills, so how they can do simple things with their hands and, and the kind of visual spatial awareness, their cognition, so puzzles and understanding and learning, and then of course their language as well. Some clinics will also do a questionnaire. So one of the more common ones, which is quite a long questionnaire, is the Vine and Adaptive Behavioral Scale, which can be all the way through to when you're 80, I think, actually. You can keep doing the violence forever. But what that does is it tells us about how a child can adapt in their regular daily living, and it's, it's also a useful thing to do. Um, so what then we, we want to really think about, I see children to their two, actually, and then I'll communicate with the local teams about what level of support is needed after that. Um, and then I'm always happy for the families to kind of get in touch with me if they need to after that. But what we want to do is make sure everything is in place to support a child as they grow and develop. And remember that the challenges are going to change as they get older. 
and if you're thinking about kind of later childhood, then of course it's important to consider ongoing referral to another child development team, particularly if there are kind of behavioral or ongoing developmental concerns. One thing that I certainly know that we, we see in, in the older kids is that there are differences in how the children, just to kind of summarize all the kind of things that we see, is really about how they relate to the world and the environment and other people around them. So understanding kind of sensory experiences, but also understanding social rules, how to interact with other people. And it makes sense when you think about it, okay? If we think back to my you know, very silly London underground analogy, if you think about those kind of things, you can imagine that if someone reaches and shakes my hand or touches me or something like that, then what happens is you have that sensation, but then I also then send signals to another station through the train lines to kind of give me the context of someone shaking my hand and me shaking it back again and me thinking about how to, to grip it and how to smile back to them and make eye contact. So you have to think then, it's not just the process of feeling someone shaking your hand and you shaking back. There's the engagement of all the other parts of the brain that are needed for that kind of social interaction. And that's where some of the challenges are really for kids with, with agenesis, I think, when we try and understand about how they're interacting with the world. It's that process of then doing that more kind of complex, shall we say, dissemination of, of activity across the rest of the brain. Um, but so it's important to say, of course, that these challenges and their impact may only be evident later. So it's important that there's awareness and there's recognition and then support that can be put in place for those things. So that's that's kind of me. I've, I've hopefully I've, I've kind of I know I've rushed through things, but hopefully I've given lots of time for chatting. So um, I suppose the summary from my end is at the moment, we're really in a point where we could say that DCC is usually identified antenatally. And the neurodevelopmental pediatrician, our role is to support the family from pregnancy through into childhood, and really to empower families with information to recognize difficulties and put the right support in place early. And uh, thank you for listening. So that's my, you, please do uh, get in contact if you like. There's my Twitter, if you wanna see some boring stuff, I try and stay out the politics, but uh, if you wanna see about the, the academic work and things like that, and that's my Twitter. Thank you. Uh, right. You don't want to read my emails. Can you hear me? Yes, lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Hopefully you, Tom. Was that was really good. On there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sorry for the delay. I was trying to switch this on. Um, yeah, any questions from the audience? Yes. So um, and I know Tom since Jimmy was born. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. Sorry, I've asked a lot of questions today. No, no. Um, just curious what you said at the start about how uh, kings see people down from sort of south of the river to Brighton and then gosh is normally people north of the river. Yeah. If it was picked up incidentally post-birth, would it be normal that someone would be referred to gosh or a neurodevelopmental paediatrician at gosh or kings or would that always be kind of at local hospital centres, obviously, asking about myself. <laughs> um, so, well, no, that, I mean, that's not necessarily a straightforward question to answer, I suppose. I mean, it depends upon the level of confidence, shall we say, that the local paediatrician might have as to whether or not they'll refer to, to a specialist centre. Okay. Um, I think in many cases, if the diagnosis is, is certain and they feel that the child is well, then they may not refer to them to a, a specialist centre. And I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing, provided they can put the right level of support in and they've got the right level of understanding that they can make sure the families feel that they, they understand what's going on. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. We are under Kings. Right. How do we get a referral to see someone like you then? Because I'm not under a neurological paediatrician. Oh, okay. So you're under Kings College Hospital or Kings College? Kings or College Evelina? Hospital. Oh, Kings College Hospital. Yeah, is it not the same one? No, just to make things <laughs> complete. So I'm part of Kings College London University, but I work at the Evelina, which is another site. It's very unhelpful. But um, so David McCormick is the, he's probably gonna shoot me because it's all on film. David McCormick is the, is the neurodisability consultant at, the, um, at King's College Hospital. Mm -hmm. Do you have specific concerns about your little one or, or you just like to be in the service where they're keeping an eye on you? There's yeah, nothing been put in, in place. Yeah, to be honest. 
and nothing's been put in place at no, the moment. No, so she's got a neurologist and she's under neuroscience at King's College. Okay. Um, I'm travelling from Brighton. Okay. Um, and I had all my scans at King's College. Okay. Um, so uh, they've kept... And how old is she now? Nearly 16 months. Okay. And to be honest, I feel like every journey to King's is a waste of train ticket money. <laughs> Because oh. <laughs> I not... sit and wait for two hours for a 15 minute appointment. Ah, oh dear. Okay. I know it's not you personally, that's my personal opinion. <laughs> and do you have a developmental paediatrician locally as no. well? No. Okay. So, um, as I said, I mean, what I talked about here is, is kind of what our practice is as opposed to necessarily what might happen in another hospital. Mm -hmm. If um, there are very specific. Um, so I was speaking with an, another parent earlier. So if there are very specific questions, then people would refer to us directly. Um, we generally, we don't necessarily like to be prescriptive in telling other places how they should be following up their, their kids, I suppose. I think um, the important thing in your particular case, I hope, is that what they're gonna be doing is seeing your child regularly and getting to a point where they will do some sort of assessment with the development to understand where she is when she when she reaches a certain age um, if you um, certainly if you'd like to come to our service or if you'd like to come to the other, any others then that's a discussion that um, you could have with the team at King's or, or in your local area and, and we would happily accept any referrals but I think uh, it's probably a conversation I would suggest you can have with the neurologist at King's first and just to say um, we just want to understand about what's what the longer term structure is for the follow up and about your development, how we're going to be making sure that the, her development is kind of formally assessed as she's growing older so we can put the right things in place for her. So just be quite uh, um, open with asking those questions and, and hopefully you'll, you'll get the right kind of answers back. Thank you. Sorry, mine's the same situation as well. So, um, if we wanted to get a referral in, would it be the doctor or the neurologist or the community paediatrician? Like, we've got a good team, but they don't know enough about it. So I know that I could get the referral to you guys, but it, who would be the best person to get that to you? Oh, it, it can actually be any of them. Okay, thank you. Um, I get very similar again. Um, I'm not from around here, we're West Yorkshire, and we're not under any neurologist at all. We're just under the paediatrician. Hello. <laughs> um, so we've literally just got the paediatrician. Should I be requesting neurological support or anything like that? Or do I, do I just keep going with the paediatrician? Um, I've never seen a neurologist other than through the MRIs and things. And then when they came back with the diagnosis, that was it. We've just seen a paediatrician. So okay. So really and and has the paediatrician, and that's the same with yourself, is it? Is it? Yeah. Okay. 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 <laughs> okay, so I mean, I think the thing to say is that neurologist is not absolutely essential. What's important is the assessment of development and, and you know, what the, the skills a child has. It's the support, really, yeah. And so, in, you know, in our centre, it's, for me, it's because I've got access to those particular networks that I then can use to get those assessments done and to support the child. But if in Yorkshire a paediatrician sees someone and is doing those assessments and making sure that you're keeping an eye on the development, the psychology and, and what's happening with the learning and things, and they can get the support in so that it can help the, the child, at school, you know, your kids at school, uh, and also think about if they need some therapy support, they can access that therapy support. And that can certainly be done through a paediatrician if they've, if they've got that network in place. Um, a neurologist, I have to confess, many neurologists, though, just to be really kind of annoying, the way that we are, that we have acute neurologists and we have neurodisability consultants and we have neurosurgeons and we're all different. And so an acute neurologist, if you were to see an acute neurologist, they'll basically, they may well look at a child and say, well, they're not having seizures, I don't need to do anything. Because that's an acute neurologist and they don't necessarily think about neurology in terms of neurodevelopment. So that's important to say that it's not necessarily the be all and end all to see a neurologist, if that makes sense. 
I think the important thing is that you make sure you see someone who's got the right focus uh, in terms of thinking about development and support for your child. I can see now. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I could see for a second, then you blinded me again. Often, <laughs> um, it, it is, it's, I listed those different types of professionals, and I didn't even have a developmental pediatrician on there, uh, which I, is a grave oversight on my part, because that is a, a good resource yeah, often. Absolutely. Um, your pediatrician or a developmental pediatrician or a developmental neurologist, but it really depends on the professional. It's yep. not just the title. And are they going to be tracking all of the things that you were just mentioning? Yeah. Are they tracking development across all sorts of domains? Yeah. Are they assessing it? Are they referring you to get assessments somewhere if yeah. they don't do it, which often they don't. But to, I tend to not encourage going back to a neurologist necessarily mm. because of what you just said. In, in my experience, often they're looking for epilepsy. They're, so they may be going, doing screening for a major issue in y those first two years. But if they're not seeing a major issue, hmm. it's a static condition. There's not a problem in hmm. their mind. They're not worrying about development. They're just screening for the p possibility of something more else hmm. going on. Would you agree? I would agree, yeah. And I, I think probably in Yorkshire, maybe the key people to think about after the acute pediatrician is seeing a child might be trying to, to get access to the child development team and the community pediatricians, because those are the guys who then have got the kind of local therapy support and also can help in terms of getting the right support needed for school and things like that too. So it might be worth having that conversation with your pediatrician, just saying longer term, you know, can we make sure or how, how can we get uh, referred to the child development team? Yeah. I think in my experience, in every locale is going to have different people that are that are really tuned in, and so getting attached to the the neurodiversity disability community around you. Sorry. So whether it's uh, whether it is um, probably not related to. DCC, but related to autism, related to cerebral palsy, whatever, and talking to the other families and finding out who in our community is a good advocate. Yeah. Who is the one who tracks development? Is it the OTs? Is yeah. it the PTs? Is it the speech people? Is it the? Yeah. It, is it the develop? Is there a good developmental pediatrician? Is there a good neuropsychologist? Find the person that's a good advocate. Yeah. And it more and it, than yeah. just. It absolutely doesn't expertise. have to be a neurologist. It, it absolutely doesn't even have to be someone who's an expert in, in agenesis or dysgenesis of the corpus callosum. It has to be someone who can understand, assess a profile of a child and understand how the right kind of support can be put in place for that child. And that's the important thing. Yeah. And um, yes, I mean, it's, it's different. Unfortunately, you know, it's always been a postcode lottery in the UK. It will be different in different places who that person is and, and how many resources there are. Um, but I, I think it's really important that you just really push to, to find that, that as, as, uh, as Lynn said, the, the advocate. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's really important to have that conversation. Thank you. Um, you mentioned about genetics. If, um, I think with your analogy, if, all, if you know all the books are in the library hmm. and in what seems like an isolated case, what would be your thoughts on looking deeper into genetics? Um, so you mean seeing a genesis and having a, a further kind of a assessment? Yeah, so I think in our, we had the amnio when I was pregnant, which didn't detect any sort of more complex issues, but it was something that was discussed when we was discharged that we could look 
to delve a bit deeper, which we haven't. It would just be interesting to get your thoughts. So I, I don't think um, for your own family, I think you mentioned your child seven or something like that now. I don't, it, it certainly wouldn't change management or, or anything like that at this stage now. I think <coughs> what we've seen is that basically the, the ability to be able to do exome sequencing, so to look at all the recipes, is now so cheap and so widespread that I think that in general, most people will just have it done even seven years on now from when you were, because I think what that does is that gives us an understanding of the wider picture. And then we can start to collect all that information together, which means then we can then feed back, you know, globally, it will all, all that information will feed together. So we, we kind of encourage families to do that now, because what it means is that it really builds up that database for ourselves to be able to, to give that information to families. In terms of whether or not it would change anything for your child now, I think the short answer is no. So I don't think you need to rush back to, to Rahul and say, you know, make sure we do the genetics, because I don't think it's, it's necessarily going to change anything. 